Avenue Wednesday night Bible class. We're thankful and grateful to those who are watching this. We're thank, thank, thankful to have you here tonight to study with us. We just pray God something will be said that will be helpful to you in your walk with Christ. That will help you learn more about Jesus. And if you're not a member of the Lord's Church, I hope something will touch your heart this evening that will prompt you to want to know more and learn more and answer the call of God. Before we get started, my name is Brother Charles L. Shaw. I'm the minister here at Grand Avenue Church of Christ that meets at 619 Grand Avenue in Sherman, Texas. Before we get started, let us have a prayer. Pray with me. I hear the Father, we come thanking you for life and strength, Father. We thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy, your long suffering that you've shown toward us. By allowing us another opportunity to come to your household of faith to study another portion of that word, Father. Pray God that everything that we say tonight be beneficial to those. It's in your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Tonight we're going to be talking about the book of Colossians, the city of Colossae. The spirit inspired letter of Colossians was written to the churches in the city of Colossae, in Laodicea. By the Apostle Paul, it is evident that Paul had never been to Colossae on a mission. He recorded a missionary journey in Colossae, but for the results of his work in Ephesus, he possibly had contact with disciples there in Colossae. The date of this 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 letter, Colossians, was one of four letters that Paul wrote during his first Roman imprisonment. He was in prison in Rome for about two years, somewhere during A.D. 61 through 63. During this first Roman imprisonment, he wrote to Ephesus. He wrote to Philippians. He wrote to Colossians and Philemon. He may even written, have written letters before the letter to the Ephesians because the letter to the Ephesians seemed to expand on the thoughts that he present in this letter. The theme of, Col of Colossians is, is taken from chapter 1 of Colossians verse 16 through 18. The key verse will be verse 18 where it says, And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that all in all things he might have the preeminence. See, Paul is focusing on the present exaltation of Christ it is in Christ that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. Therefore, Paul is overall things talking about all things were created by Christ. The theme of the letter, therefore, could be stated that the book focuses on the Christ of the church, whereas Ephesians focuses on the church of the Christ. So the top purpose of the book of Colossians, the Colossian church as well as to all other churches in Western Asia Minor, which is where this was located, in a religious culture that was greatly influenced by Far East mysticisms. This was a mixture of Eastern mysticism with Judaism, produced a Judeo-Gnosticism. Them some, them some wild words, but these, these, these religions permeated the synagogues when the church was first established in that region. See, there were Jewish converts who seemed to have brought some of their worldviews into the church 
And how much are we seeing that today in today's church where a lot of the world views are being brought into the church not realizing how damaging that is to the church. But even back then there was a lot of religions being mixed in and we've been brought into the church bringing their reverence and thus they were attacking the nature of who Jesus is in reference to his being and authority as one with the Godhead. They was attacking Jesus back then of saying that Jesus was not a part of the Godhead. He was not divine. So even back then they had issues of accepting Jesus. Today we still have the issues of some people not want to accept Jesus as the Son of God. They will accept him as a prophet. But even in Colossians, they was having these issues. See, there were heresies of Gnosticism. And it was not dealt with directly in the letter that Paul wrote. But from what Paul says in this letter, there was a prevalent belief that Jesus was at least above the level of man. They placed Jesus at least above man. But they wouldn't put him divinely, heavenly. They put him just above man. So it was believed that he was superior to man, but not great enough to qualify him to be the sacrificial offering of the incarnate God. Why would they not believe? Why didn't they want to accept Jesus? And it's because the Jews had the idea of a warrior king. Jesus came humbly. He was humble. And they can't view. They weren't viewing Jesus as a warrior king. So they, he couldn't be the one. That, that, that God is sent down here. But. He was. So they. Can accept him as being a level above men. They can accept him as being superior to men. But not great enough to qualify him. As a sacrificial offering, the incarnate God on behalf of humanity. He was superhuman, however. He was not deity as God, as they say. Now, in conjunction with the preceding false concepts that seem to permeate the worldview, so there was false concepts that the world had. We as Christians, we, we must understand we don't have the same concepts as the world. But they had false concepts that seemed to permeate the worldview of some of the Colossians. And it was a system of legalistic relig religiosity that came into the church as a substitute for salvation by God's grace. This system of religion was common in the religious institutions of the culture among the Jews and Gentiles. Those systems of religion that was taught that through legal actions of religious obedience, one can place demands on God in order to merit salvation. They are creating, trying to create their own legal actions into some putting words into God's mouth, so to speak. Now, Epaphras, who was one of the evangelists of the region, was experiencing the invasion of Judeo Gnosticism among the Colossians disciples. That's why this is why it's very important that we as Christians, the members of the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, we must stick together with those who have a common goal with us. The Bible says we we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Which means we don't get involved in the concepts of the world. We gotta be careful that we watch it who we are accepting advice from, so to say. But the, the disciples back in that time, the Christians in that time, was experiencing the invasions of Judeo, Judeo Gnosticism among the Colossian disciples. The influence of this teaching was possibly affecting the church. Then we bring the world view into the church, you're bringing stuff in that's going to affect the church. It's going to 
trying to steer the church in a direction that it shouldn't go. He's going to try to bring teachings into the church that shouldn't be brought in. That's because we are a, 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 a corroborating with the world, bringing some of their views into the church. We, we cannot afford to allow that to happen. So the teaching was possibly affecting the church in the neighboring cities of Laodicea and Heropolis. Now, Epaphras, the evangelist, thus traveled to Rome, where he explained the situation to Paul. He was having such a hard time that he had to go to Rome to talk with Paul, the great apostle, and realizing that, that the very foundation of the church was under attack by a teaching that corrupted the nature of who Jesus Christ was. The Holy Spirit moved Paul. And then move Paul to what? To write this letter to the disciples in the region of Colossae. The Ep Epaphras, Epaphras, Epaphras was telling Paul about this doctrine, about this religion that's invading the church. How some of the disciples in Colossae was bringing their worldviews into the church. How that it was a affecting the church in neighboring cities of Laodicea and Heropolis. So Paul immediately wrote a letter to Colossae, to the disciples in Colossae, and the letter was directed primarily to the Colossian disciples. Now, though it was to be read to the disciples in Laodicea and Heropolis, who were not far away, Paul's purpose, what was Paul's purpose for writing these letters? It was therefore was to, one, exalt the preeminence of Jesus over all things. He had to remind them that Jesus was made head over all things. Not some of the things, but he was made head over all things. So that's part of the things he put in that letter. Two, Paul put in to explain his apostolic work of preaching the truth of the gospel in a world of false religion. So they had false religion then. We got false religion today. And we are obligated to, to teach the world the true doctrine. The true gospel of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, Paul's purpose for writing these letters was to exhort the Colossian disciples to maintain Christian, Christian principles in their behavior. See, it's gotten to the point their behavior was changed. See, when you get involved with the world, you start bringing that world view into the church, you're risking the behavior of some Christians in the church where they are starting to change their behavior. So Paul had to exalt the preeminence of Jesus. He had to explain his apostolic work by preaching the truth of the gospel, and he had to exhort the Colossian disciples to maintain Christian principles in their behavior. Now, some of the historical background to this city, Colossae. Colossae was a city of Phrygia, in the western part of Asia. Minor, the cities of Heropolis and Laodicea was nearby. The city of Colossae was located on the Lycus River which was about 100 miles east of the city of Ephesus. And what was so special about Colossae? Colossae was a commercial city that traded in textile, wood, and precious dye. And that was unique to that area. And it was also a religious center. Since we mean it's a religious center, I mean a lot of religions came through this area. It was a religious center being located were being the location of the throne of the goddess Sibel. Now, Stoic and Epicurean, the philosophies with the Egyptian religion, abounded in the area. So there was a lot of philosophies going on, and where there's a lot of different philosophies, a lot of different doctrine, you're going to have chaos. You're going to have confusion. And where the church is being located there, I mean, they're going to have infiltration of all these doctrines that they got up fight through. They got to defend again to keep out of the church. So the chances of some of that stuff creeping in to the church was was great. 
it was a great chance that it was going to creep in. So Colossi was a commercial city, we see. Because it was on a trade route between Rome and the Far East. Now the teaching of Oriental religions with their mysticisms infiltrated the area and flourished at the time the letter was written. Simply the time that went at the time that Paul wrote this letter. All these religions was infiltrating the city. It was flourishing at that time. Now in the second century before Christ came, Antiochus III resettled about 2,000 Jewish families in the area of the Colossae. Now he said that Judaism had been influenced by religious beliefs of the Far East. When these Jews were resettled in Asia Minor, they brought with them Judaism that was influenced with the mystic beliefs of the religion of the region. Mesopotamia and religions from the east, they all mixed in, was influenced by each other. So at the time, Paul wrote the prison epistles, because Paul was in prison, was the beginning of this philosophy, it had already been initiated. So see, all this is already started. So Paul already got an uphill battle to deal with in Colossians. All the different religions that has taken place, that's infiltrated in the church. Paul has an uphill battle that he's he trying to strengthen the Colossian church, the Colossi church, and the disciples there to maintain your Christian behavior. Stand firm on who you know Jesus is. So Paul wrote the letter. The principal beliefs of the heresy was already portrayed in the church. Therefore, in this letter to the Colossian brethren, as well as the other prison letters, and the letters to Timothy and the Corinthians, Paul mentioned those religious philosophies. They denied the external being of the Son of God and His present existence as God overall. The churches of Colossae, Heropolis, and Laodicea were probably started by emperors, though Paul possibly visited Heropolis and Laodicea during the almost three years he worked with the Christians in Ephesus. Now, the key thing you want, I want to speak about here, something about the historical background, is the church in Colossae probably consisted mainly of Gentiles converts, though there were many Jews in the region. And consequently among the disciples because there is little direct reference to the Old Testament by quotation. Now it is believed that the church was composed primarily of Gentiles. However, in another there is a strong reference to Judaism, which was a system of religion of the Jews that they had constructed after their own tradition. Tradition is very dangerous. It was this system of religion in conjunction with the religious influences that the Gentiles brought into the church. See, we keep seeing this narrative of, of religious things that's happening in the world being brought into the church. See, it's saying the religious influences that the Gentiles brought into the church that Paul attacks in this letter. Paul attacks it. In this letter, if it was right, Paul wouldn't be attacking it. But the influence that the Gentiles brought in, Paul attacks the, that in this letter. He begins first by reaffirming the nature of the being, which is the existence and authority of Jesus. They were downplaying Jesus and bringing all this other stuff in. So Paul is reaffirming the nature of the being, the existence and authority of Jesus. If Jesus is he who he said he was, such should motivate Christians' behavior. And after affirm the nature of Jesus' present existence, Paul thus moves into the Christ-like behavior of those who have submitted to the Lordship of Jesus over all things. Now we're going to get started on a little bit of chapter number one.
see how far we can get. The Bible says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Notice Paul always had the common manner of addressing the disciples. Paul addressed these disciples from the ministry of his Christ sent apostleship, letting them know that he is an apostle, which means he met Jesus, he spoke with Jesus, which makes him an apostle. And we know the apostle is someone who 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 walked with Jesus, someone who saw Jesus do the miracle, someone who saw Jesus die and saw him resurrected. So Paul says an apostle of Christ Jesus. He was a Christ sent apostle because he was a person he called and commissioned by God. When God, Jesus stopped him on the Damascus Road, Jesus commissioned Paul at that very moment. And he says, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God, our Father. Now Paul was teaching in this letter came to him by the Holy Spirit. One cannot claim to be a Christian and at the same time affirm that Paul is here giving only his personal opinions or theology concerning these matters. See, Paul is attacking the influences that is infiltrating the church and he is just not there to just claim to be a Christian. He's there to reaffirm that Jesus is the Christ. Paul does not write from opinion or personal thought. He writes by the direct revelation from God and describes these words by the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So God is telling Paul, he told Paul what he should do. And Paul is speaking for what the Spirit is telling him to speak. And it's not just speaking his own opinion. He writes by the direct revelation from God. He writes those things that God wants the disciples to know. Timothy was with Paul in Rome at the time Paul wrote this letter. He was the young evangelist who was now seasoned with years of experience and was with his father in the faith. Paul, Paul was Timothy's father in the faith. Verse 2 of the Bible says, To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. The word faithful here is often misunderstood in the present world, where people often see Jesus as only a good teacher. But Paul's use of the word here was on those who were faithful in their beliefs, in the foundation upon which Christians... Christians remained true to their calling. They were faithful in believing that Jesus was the incarnate deity who offered himself as a ransom for humanity. These were those who had responded to their beliefs in the revealed grace of God by obedience to the gospel and thus were washed of their sins. These were thus faithful disciples who had not turned from their beliefs that Jesus was the Christ and Son of God. So there were some Christians who still held Jesus up to be who he was and who he said he was. They still held Jesus up to be head over all things. They were not yet influenced by things, by the other religions like some Christians in the church was. They still held Jesus as deity. So they were the faithful. When you hold Jesus in the spot, you are one of the faithful believers. Jesus was the incarnate deity who offered himself as a ransom for humanity. The Bible said these were those who had responded to their beliefs in the revealed grace of God by obedience to the gospel and thus were washed of their sin. Acts 38. They were the saints of God. Why? Because they had been washed in the blood of the Lamb. He said they were saints of God. 
how they become saints of God? By being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Acts 2, 22, 16, where Paul was told, Why tarriest thou rise up and be baptized? These were thus faithful disciples who had not turned from their beliefs that Jesus was the Christ and Son of God who was head over all things. Out of all the religions, the Gnosticism, the mysticism that was flowing into Colossae, a religious center on a trade route, there was a few that held their belief that Jesus was the Christ and Son of God who was the head over all things. See, this was Paul's common reaching to the churches. Grace is the foundation upon which our salvation rests. Peace with God is the result of grace. See, it's because of grace that we got peace with God. Without grace, we wouldn't have peace with God. It is peace that results from knowing that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, John 3.16. So we need to be thankful to God. Verse 3, the Bible says, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. That's 3 to 4. It says, We always, who is Paul? is talking about Paul and Timothy. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Why? Because we have heard of your faith in Christ. We heard that you still trust and you still believe in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of the saints. See, it is saying we give thanks. Both Paul and Timothy were sincerely thankful for the faithfulness of the Colossian Christian. They were thankful that there were those who were standing strong. Thankful for there were those who still had the faith, the trust, and the belief in Christ Jesus. And they were sincerely thankful for the faithfulness of the Colossian Christian. First Colossians 1 and 4 and Ephesians 1 16. Now, their thankfulness, what well, Paul and Timothy's thankfulness was manifested in their continual prayers for the Colossians. They said, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we what? We have heard. Say we heard of your faith. See, when you got true, sincere faith, it gets out. And people will hear about your faith. He said, we have heard of your faith. Epaphras had come to Rome and he had reported to Paul and to Timothy the loving nature of the Colossian disciples who maintained their faith with all of the infiltration of the Gnosticism, all of the infiltration of all the different religions, the Oriental the Gnostic religions. All this stuff that was creeping in, infiltrating the church. Epaphras was telling Paul and Timothy about the loving nature of the Colossian disciples who maintained their faith. What do we got to do to, in today's time? When we find all this stuff that's trying to creep into the church today, we got to maintain our faith. We got to hold on. To our belief, trust in God. Continue to to set Jesus first in the place where He belongs. To put Jesus, He is the head over all things. We got to be just as the Colossian disciples who maintained their faith. Now, He said, "Because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints." Love for all the saints. See, no man can claim to have faith in Jesus without loving also the body of Christ. You can't say you love Jesus 
but you, you don't like, you don't love the body of Christ. Someone in the church that, that, that you're not getting along with. You can't say you love Jesus, but you don't love that person. Your enemy. You can't love Jesus if you don't love your enemy. See, the love for all the saints. No one can claim to have faith in Jesus without loving also the body of Christ. Matthew 5, 43-48. Now, all Christians must love the brotherhood of Christians. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. It is by such love that brethren are identified as members of the body of Christ. See, when we show love toward one another, we are exemplifying Christian. We are exemplifying that we are sons of God. For Jesus said, people will know me, you, me by the love you show toward one another. See, when they see you loving one another, they see Jesus. They see God. Because God is love. So we, we must love one another. We must get along with each other. If we want the world to see God. See, all Christians must love the brotherhood of Christians. Then it says, it is by such love that brothers are identified as members of the body of Christ. Then we go on in, in verse number 5 where it says, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up. See, it is the hope now it's saying. We say we have heard of your faith. He said that you have love for all of the saints and for the hope in heaven. The reason they had faith in God, the reason they had brotherly love was because of their hope of eternal dwelling in the presence of God. If your hope and desire is to make heaven your home, you must have faith. You must have love for all of the saints. To identify and mark that you are a child of God. But then you got to have hope in heaven. You got to have faith in God. And brotherly love was because of your hope of eternal dwelling in the presence of God. There's got to be your, your hope. There's got to be your desire to have eternal, eternal dwelling in the presence of God. See, their, their common hope, the Colossian disciples, their common hope brought them together into a brotherhood. We got to have a common hope that brings us together in the brotherhood of Christians today. You should, we should be able to go to any church of Christ and greet any member of the body of Christ as brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. We should have love toward one another. Whether we're in the same city or not, whether we're in the same country, we should be able to go to other churches of Christ and show brotherly love. We got a hope in heaven. We got a common hope brought them together. You got to bring us together. Of all those who have the same hope of eternal life. Then it says. You, it says in verse 5 the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you were in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel now it's about the truth of the gospel we have heard of it in the truth of the gospel we have talked about we have heard of your faith we heard of the love you have for all of the saints. Paul and Timothy talk. We heard of the hope you have in heaven. And now we are speaking about the truth of the gospel. See, the Colossian disciples had not personally witnessed the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that was a lot of the reason why they didn't promote Jesus as being deity. Because they didn't see the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, they didn't see the gospel in action like the apostles did. 
So Paul had to reaffirm, had to show them and, and tell them to continue to push Jesus. Jesus was the head over all things. Now, the truth of the event of Jesus' death for our sins and resurrection, for our hope, was reported to, to them evangelistically who had gone into all the world to preach the good news. What is the good news? The death, burial, and the resurrection. The good news is the gospel. That's why the evangelists went into all the world to preach the gospel, to preach that Jesus, that he died on the cross, that he was raised up from the dead, and now he been gone back to heaven. That is the gospel, the truth, something that they hadn't received. So it was reported by the evangelists all over the world, the good news. The Colossians believed the report. Now notice, they didn't see the events of the resurrection and the death of Jesus and his resurrection. But it says the Colossians believed the report of the gospel event. And they accepted it as true. When I mean, you got a sincere heart. And you open your mind. And open the door for Jesus to come through. For you see I stand at the door and knock. He's the door of your mind. It's the door of your heart knocking. Begging you to let him come in. When you do this. You. Will believe. The gospel. And you will accept it without any hesitation. They accepted it. Then in verse 6 it said, That has come to you. See, the truth of the gospel that has come to you, the truth about which Paul refers is the good news of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus that was, that was reported throughout the Roman Empire. Paul was pleased with that. First Corinthians, First Corinthians, First Colossians, fifteen one through four, I believe. And maybe First Colossians, I think it's First Corinthians, fifteen one through four. He was not talking about a body of religious regulation concerning which they must legally conform. Paul was talking about the report of the death of Jesus on the cross. Why? For the salvation of all those who will respond to God's grace through faith. See, they show faith. They didn't see it, but they believe because of what they heard. What we do, we, ain't, we have not seen Jesus, but we got faith and belief that He is, that He is the Son of God. Excuse me for getting to a preaching mode. Now, yeah. Paul refers to the good news that they believe. And he was not talking about the body of religion. He was talking about the report of the death of Jesus on the cross that brought salvation of all those who would respond to the grace of God. Now, then in verse 7, where verse 6 says, That has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit. In all the world, this phrase refers to the Roman world. Now, by the time Paul wrote this letter in AD 62, the report of the death and resurrection of Jesus had gone forth into all the Roman Empire. This accomplishment of evangelism could not have been carried out exclusively by the apostles. Jesus had instructed to them to teach those they baptized all things that he had commanded them in Matthew 28 20. Now, for this to transport, be transported that quickly, before Paul got this letter out, Jesus commanded the Great Commission to go out and teach. And when they go out and teach, they taught them to baptize them. And they taught them how to evangelize. He says the accomplishments of evangelism could not have been carried out exclusively by the apostles. We simply state that they couldn't do it by 
themselves. Jesus had instructed them to teach those they baptized all things that he had commanded them. So the ones they were teaching and baptizing, they were teaching them all things. Why? So that they can go to their region and wherever they was heading to and teach as well. That is how the gospel spread it. That's what we must be doing today. Going out. Teaching the world. Teaching them what? Teaching them all things that was taught by Jesus. Now we're running out of time tonight. We've been talking about Colossians, the book of Colossians. We started it. And hopefully in the next opportune time we come together, we will pick up where we left off here in Romans chapter, I mean, excuse me, Colossians chapter 1. We stopped at verse number, number 6. I hope the study has been beneficial to you tonight and it's very beneficial to me and I hope you enjoyed the study and I hope I wasn't going too fast for you but with due of time I was trying to get as much in as I possibly could because I knew I had to go through a lot of introductory a lot of uh, purpose tell you what the purpose of the book was about the historical background of the book and the theme and the date of the book hopefully next time we get to talk we can get dwelled deeper into this book. Let us pray to God. I had a father come once again with our throne of faith about his and I'm hearts. Thank you, Father, again for blessing us with the opportunity to study another portion of thy word. We just pray, God, that the word that was presented tonight was presented in a way that was pleasing itself in our sight, and that it will be beneficial to those who have heard, and that it may edify and uplift those. And if anyone who heard was not a member of the Lord's church, your church, Father, that something was said that would touch them in their heart to make them ask the question, what must they do to be saved? That, that will help them to realize they stand a gift to distance from you and make them to answer the call that you, that you send out for them, Father. This business at this time we end this class, Father. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And oh, how sweet Yeah.